Well, good morning, Pathway. We are so excited that you are here to worship with us, to celebrate who God is and what he has done. This morning, we're going to sing a song that has a, the lyric that Jesus is the second Adam. And in the book of Romans, chapter 5, it says that through one man, Adam, the first man God ever made, sin entered the world, and therefore death entered the world as well, separation from God. But it continues and it says, but also through one man, even more so through one man, Jesus Christ, the second Adam, so life, forgiveness, righteousness might be given to us, salvation might be given to us, freedom from our sin, freedom from death might come as well. And so this morning, we come in here celebrating the new life Jesus has given us. We come in here celebrating knowing who God is, that he is the one who's loved us enough to give this to us freely if we believe, if we accept, we call on his name. And so this morning, let us respond to who he is. Let us respond to what he's done and celebrate that he is the second Adam giving us new life. Will you stand with us as we rejoice in who Jesus is? I call you healer. You can mend any broken heart. I call you faithful father. You finish everything you start. My soul was made to respond.
Amen. He is our living hope. We have just sung about who he is, that he's our faithful father, the second Adam, and that he has given us new life and he lives forever. He reigns in victory. So let us continue to worship him by just declaring that he is the Lord, that his name is holy and set apart, that he is worthy to be praised with all that we have. So let's sing out together. Your road in everlasting night, your glory floods the earth and fills the skies, almighty God, there's no one like you, mountains tremble when you speak, I'm listening and whisper changes.
As the ushers come forward, I would love to just continue to consider the worthiness of Christ, that he is holy, that he is set apart, that he is above all things. And as we prepare to give our offerings, I'd love for us to even think of uh, a birthday party and how when we come to that, we will bring gifts for people that we know, for people that we love. And we bring these gifts to them and we give them to them because we want to honor them. We want to celebrate them. We want to show our love or our appreciation for who they are, who they have been to us. And certainly God and giving to him is so much bigger, so much better than a birthday party. But in the same way, we're not forced to give, but we want to give out of our love for him. We want to give out of responding to who he has shown himself to be to us, his faithfulness, his kindness, his generosity. He has been so faithful to us, and so we want to faithfully give back, just like we would someone that we love in our own lives. And so as we think about this, we think about how worthy Jesus is of these things that we give to him. I'd love for us as the buckets are being passed just to sing, you are the Lord, one more time. You are the Lord, forever lifted high, you are the Lord, your compassionate and kind, you are the Lord, holy, holy, holy is your name, you Father, you are the Lord. You reign above all. You are holy. You are mighty. You're worthy to be praised. We remember that you are our faithful Father, the second Adam, to lead us home, to give us new life. And we thank you for these things. You are a living hope. You have defeated death, and you reign victorious. You are the Lord. You're compassionate and kind to us. And so, Lord, we want to respond to that with our giving, with our worship just to show you, just to tell you that we love you. And Jesus, we do love you. So it's in your name we pray, we give, we worship. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Hey, before you take a seat, will you turn to someone next to you, tell them good morning, and tell them how glad you are that they're here. Welcome to Pathway. We really are so glad to be together. An amazing uh, morning of worship as well. Whether you're worshiping right here in this room with us or whether you're worshiping with us online or up in the venue, it really is so good to be together this weekend. Well, I want to tell you about a really special service that's coming up in about three weeks, the weekend of Thanksgiving, November 26 and 27, and it's going to be a service full of Thanksgiving and full of celebration. And one of the things that's going to make it such a celeb celebratory service is the fact that we get to walk through baptism during that weekend. And baptism is simply an expression of uh, publicly being able to say, I have made a choice to follow Jesus. I've surrendered my life and I've trusted in Jesus. And it's a, it's a public demonstration of that to your family and your friends and those within your church family as well. And so if, if you would, um, if you've been considering that, whether you follow Jesus for a, a long time, but you just have never taken that step of baptism, or whether you you're a new follower of Jesus and, it's, and you know that this is a time you want to take that next step as well, then we would love to celebrate with you on that weekend. So you can check um, out uh, more information about that by texting the word baptism to the Pathway text number, or you can step out at the end of service and talk to anyone on our Next Steps team right out the Next Steps area. We would love to be able to have a conversation with you about that. You can check the Pathway website or the PCC at Home app as well and find out all the information about that. There is a... Uh, baptism class about one week ahead, so just make sure you get signed up in time for that as well 
it, we would just love to be able to celebrate that with you. And it's such a, a momentous a moment as well. And so we're excited for that. Well, we have been in the middle of a series called Beneath the Surface. We've been talking about how our emotional health ties into our spiritual health, and it allows us to be further um, spiritually mature. And so we get to hear today a story from someone in our own church body who has uh, lived this out and has not only lived this out, but is learning to share it with those that he has influence with. And so we're excited to hear his story. And so pull out your Bible and uh, pull out your sermon notes and get ready after we watch this together for the next message in Beneath the Surface. Everybody has emotions, and not everyone understands how to deal with their own emotions. There's this incredible increase in anxiety and stress among teenagers. I grew up in a divorced family. I lived with my mom. Kind of thinking back on what I missed out on growing up is I, I didn't have that constant father figure who was pouring into me. I don't know how many of these kids have someone pouring into them. What's really unique about the kind of job that I have is that in a lot of cases, I get to know them from the time they come in as freshmen until they graduate. It's Jera! Good morning! When you spend that much time with kids and walking through so many different life experiences with them, you really kind of get to know what makes them tick. I think what we take away from other people is how we were treated by them. It's often not the words that were said, it was how were the words said. So if we're not careful, then the emotions that we're not even aware of could have a really bad impact on somebody. And if we're talking about sharing the gospel with people, you know, we're the only Bible somebody may ever read. And if our emotions don't allow them to read it the way God intended for it to be read, then we're doing a disservice to being able to share that within the faith. I just see kids all the time, you know, stressing and worrying and constantly not where they are. One of the things I try to remind the students all the time is just be where your feet are. You know, there's all of those other distractions, they're gonna be around you. If you're thinking about the test that's coming next period, you're not thinking about how to make this great sound. Or if you're thinking about, you know, the way this person looked at you in the hallway, you're not thinking about making this great moment. I think getting kids to be centered where they are in the moment is one of the most important things we do. They go on and they're in a college, how are they gonna deal with that first semester of finals? If they can get something out of that that says, you know what, just stay in the moment, don't worry about what's coming, don't worry about what just happened. You know, great musicians are great listeners, and you spell the word listen and silent with the exact same letters. And the other word that you can spell out of those words is the word still. So in order to be able to listen, you have to first be still. And this is where I think God's emotions that he wired into me come out because I wear mine on my sleeve. That's just, that's just how I'm made. So, you know, sometimes I'll get emotional and they'll see that that's okay. They'll see it's okay for a man to cry every once in a while or, you know, to get really intense about something. Being able to, to lead a program where we're constantly challenging and, and pushing kids to become better, but also in, a, in an area where they can feel safe to fail and then come back from that even stronger understanding what those emotions are and how we can embrace those and how we can understand them and how we can continue to learn from them. It really brings us back to God, this great creator, creating us uniquely and ultimately being comfortable enough to say, this is how you made me and I love you for that. I was looking at, you know, at our practice field one day and I needed some exercise. So I started walking and I started talking. At first it was, I'd walk around the front of the field and I would just, you know, I'd pray about a couple of things. And then the next time it was, I kind of got to the back of the field. And then before long, it was 45 minutes of just circling the field in prayer. I started thinking about people that are gonna be in that space, when, whether it was a student or whether that was a parent who is volunteering their time or whether it was one of our staff members. What I started seeing as a result of that was our students that I had specifically prayed for doing better at the things that, that we were doing. I mean, just every aspect of the things that we got, that were prayed about just seemed more vibrant. The front ensemble is playing 
and they have a tendency to push slightly, okay? Why am I so passionate about it? I had some great influences when I was younger, and I saw how much of a difference that made in my life. I don't know how many of these kids have someone pouring into them, and why not me? If they're here, and I'm here, and God has put us in the same place, if they don't get it from me, they may not get it from anywhere. You guys have knocked it out of the park. I don't say it enough, but you guys have done a tremendous job. And I'm not talking about, like, the big things. I'm talking about the relationship things. And the reason we have been successful is because of what you've done. I couldn't be more proud of you guys. I just couldn't. There we go! Yes! Got an email a couple weeks ago from a student who had a really, really rough time last year. And just kind of out of the blue, she said, hey, I just wanted to you know, let you know that I'm doing really well. This is what's going on in my life. I've got this great job. I'm, I'm going to college now. What I learned in being a part of the program really shaped who I'm becoming now. And like those moments are, those are the best. You are ready! Wow, what an incredible story. I met Doug years ago and connected with him, realized we had a lot in common with our passion for Jesus and students and just the way God is moving in the world. And he is so authentic. He has such a kingdom mindset. And the Carol Marching Band just yesterday competed for state. They got eighth place, which may not sound that high, but it's actually really significant. And I think it'd be great for us as a church to just say we're proud of them and thank Doug, put our hands together. Oh. So oh, good. Well, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Brad. I'm one of the pastors around here. I want to welcome everybody online, upstairs in the venue. I'm so thankful always for the opportunity to dive into some things with you that I think God has for us. I want to ask you, have you ever heard the story of the last transmission that the Titanic sent before it hit the iceberg? Have you ever heard this story? The Titanic set sail across the ocean. We all know the, you know, the main part of the story. But uh, the night of April 14th, 1912, it, the Titanic received five warnings about icebergs. And then 20 minutes or so before midnight, a sixth warning came in. And it just said, watch out for icebergs. To which the operator of the ship replied, shut up, I'm busy. Like seconds after that transmission, that ship hits the iceberg, and three hours later, that ship is on the bottom of the ocean. It's an incredible story, actually, when you think about it. Shut up, I'm busy. We've been talking about this image of the iceberg, actually. It's an image that teaches us a lot about ourselves. And when you see an iceberg, what you see if you're on land or if you're maybe on a boat in the water is actually only a small part of what's really there. I think only about 10% of the iceberg actually gets above the water. Where is the rest of the iceberg? It's the title of our sermon series. The 9 a.m. crowd was on it, so I don't know about you guys. I don't know what you're going for here. It's where? Beneath the surface, thank you. All of the venue people, they just shouted it out. They were on it. But here in the room, we just need to think a little bit. It's daylight savings time weekend. We had extra sleep. We're kind of groggy. We're getting there, though, I think. We're ready. It really is. Uh, most of the iceberg is beneath the surface. And the same thing is true of you. And the same thing is true of me. Most of what is, makes me me is not visible. You can't see it right now. You can't really get to know me for who I really am just seeing me on stage. Most of me is beneath the surface, and most of you, too, are things that people don't see, your spiritual side, your social side, your emotional side. And really, that's been driving us in this series. We've been, as a church, pursuing God's work in our lives beneath the surface. We've been asking God as a church, just come down into the depths of me and move me and change me and work in me. And we've been studying together, especially our life groups, have been studying a book written by a pastor named Peter Scazzaro called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And the idea of the book is that you really can't be emotionally, you can't, really can't be mature spiritually until you're mature emotionally. And, and it is so, so true. And I want to talk to you this morning about what I believe is maybe the most basic thing we need to be strong emotionally. Now, I'm not bringing you a lot of science on this one. I'm just bringing you my opinion on this. This is true for me. The most basic thing I need, and a lot of you 
probably need this too, to be emotionally strong and therefore probably spiritually strong. Somebody want to take a guess what it is? You looked at the sermon note title. Good job. It is. It's rest. It is. It's actually on a very basic level. It is sleep. Now, I know that there are some people out there who can function without sleep or with very little sleep. I, I know you're there. In fact, by a show of hands, is there anybody here that would say, I can have a bad night's sleep, not get that much, get a few hours, and the next day I'm mostly fine? Like, is that some, some of you are here, okay? There's several of you here. We see you, and we love you, but we're not all like you, okay? Is there anybody here that's on the opposite end of that spectrum? If you don't get your sleep, it is a bad day. Like, it's, you struggle. Like, it is not good. That is a little bit me, too. I, I kind of go back and forth. I might be kind of right there in the middle, but I am telling you, it is. It's like one of the mo most basic needs we have. I mean, I was uh, reading up on this a little bit. If you go just 24 hours without sleep, not only are you drowsy, but you become irritable, and you start to have impaired decision-making. If you go any longer than that, like 36 hours, actually your body temperature, your mo metabolism, your stress levels, your hormones all change. And then if you go longer than just 36 hours without sleep, it actually significantly impairs your immune system. Like you begin to die if you don't rest, if you don't sleep, I think it's so fascinating that God created us with a reoccurring need to just stop and shut it down and turn it off. Everything has to stop every day. All of our work, all of our play, every responsibility. Even if you're a parent, you got little kids, sorry, I need to sleep. Now, some of you are like, actually, it doesn't work that way. But uh, it, for a little bit, at least, you just have to shut it down. You just have to go to bed. You have to sleep to survive. And I, I want to tell you what I think is actually maybe the dumbest idea that has entered into the church. Okay? Uh, I can speak about this idea because it's a youth ministry idea. Okay? I've been a youth pastor for a long time. And there is this, this uh, thing that some youth ministries do. It's called an all-nighter. <laughs> and somehow this idea came into the church world. It came into my world. I've probably done five of them here, or six. I don't know, way too many. And the concept of an all-nighter, we would usually just do it for the guys. Occasionally the girls did one. I wasn't there. But the, uh, the guys, we would call it the Brover-nighter. And so at the Brover Nighter, what you do is you get a couple tables out and you just load them with sugar and caffeine and pizza. And then you bring a bunch of immature teenage boys out to the church and you tell them, we're going to stay up all night. And then you think that something good is going to come out of that. <laughs> and you realize that doesn't happen. It really doesn't work like that. Like, I don't know what I was thinking, but I would do these. And, and I love our students. They are wonderful. I love spending time with them. But... Uh, I remember one year, I went to our facilities director, and I said, hey, we need to do our, our guys overnighter, and already he's like, oh, no, and I said, we need to do it on a Saturday night this year, because there's a sporting event, we want to stream it, get all the guys together, and he's like, Brad, we've got church on Sunday morning. And I'm like, I promise you, I will have this place cleaned up. Uh, we will get it all figured out. We'll get them moved out of there by 7 a.m. Church isn't until 9 a.m. We're going to be okay. He goes, you sure? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, I did not have this place cleaned up. And I had to walk into his office that week and have a pretty ouchy conversation with him. Because it just didn't happen. I ended up with what? Impaired decision making. And it just was not, I was not, by, I, by the time I got to 6 a.m., I was not my best self. Like, I was just toast. And then it ruins me for the, like, the next two days. Like, what was I thinking? I remember that year, actually, I probably shouldn't say this, but um, the uh, Kid City staff came in that Sunday morning, and um, they were getting ready, and they came into the kindergartner room, and this six-foot-five senior guy had rolled himself up in the carpet in the kindergarten room. I don't even know how he got in there. And I didn't know he was in there. I was cleaning up in other parts of the building, and I left at 7 a.m. They come in at 8.15 and find a six-foot-five senior guy totally passed out in the kindergarten room. And they have to kick that kid out of there. I mean, I got so much trouble for that. It was not a good day for me. It was, really, it was really a problem. And the truth is, getting some rest is, uh, gosh, it is just so valuable. 
It is so significant in our lives. And I, I love it when I look at the Bible and I look at Jesus' story especially, that he really modeled this, that Jesus was no stranger to this topic. I'll give you a couple verses. Uh, Luke 5, 16, favorite verse of mine, very simple. And it's one of those verses that camps out in the middle of a lot of stuff going on. But if you just look at this and you think about it, this is actually a really big deal. It just says Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Like Jesus needed to get away from it all. Like this guy needed to just pull away and rest. Let me give you another one. This is Mark chapter 4. Jesus takes his disciples on a boat ride, says, hey, we're going to go across the lake. And while they're on the, you know, going across the lake, this big storm comes up. And it says the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. But Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. I love this because Jesus was like, I know you got problems. I got to sleep right now. Deal with it. Like they wake him up and he's like, what's the issue? He just has this moment with them and he tells them when in the waves to calm down. But even in the midst of a storm, Jesus says, sorry, I got to shut it down. Uh, here's another passage. This is Mark chapter 6, 31. It says uh, that in 32, so many people were coming to the disciples and Jesus that they didn't even have a chance to eat. And then here's what it says. Jesus says, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Like, Jesus just invited them. Like, hey, you got to rest. You've got to shut it down. I want to ask you guys, um, if, if you're like me at all, and if you have uh, things that are your go-to when you need to rest, do you have a go-to thing that helps you when you just really need to shut it down? If you do, I want to know about it because I pulled all of these things from my house, all right? And if you have even one of these, that'll make me feel better, all right? Um, here's one. Does anybody have, like, a white noise machine? That, is that your go-to, anybody? You can turn, you got to have it on. Thank you. Uh, five of you. Okay. Few of you. You have the white noise or you, or you put a fan on or something. I talked to somebody yesterday and they turn on uh, stadium crowd noise. And I thought, that's not me. I don't need that. I just need some white noise, you know. So I got one of these and when we travel, we can take it with us. I thought that was, that was pretty great. Uh, how about this one? I think that's a pretty common one. Uh, does anybody do like Tylenol PM or Advil PM or just Benadryl? Is that anybody? You know, you can skip the Tylenol and the Advil and just go straight to the Benadryl. Like that's the thing that's making you sleepy. You can just go straight to the Benadryl. Uh, how about essential oils? Anybody need essential oils? People out there own it. Come on. It's okay. Essential oils, people. All right. Uh, you please don't raise your hands on this one, but you know sometimes we get prescriptions that came from my house. Okay, um, how about calm gummies? Have you heard of these things? Or like magnesium in them or something? Uh, children ages one to four to twelve take one. Adults thirteen and above take four. <laughs> That's what happens. <laughs> Somebody just wrote in their sermon notes: buy calm gummies. Like, they're a thing. Or melatonin gummies. Anybody? Melatonin or... Okay, we got some people out there. All right, this is my go-to. This is really my go-to. I cannot sleep unless I have the eye mask. I'm an eye mask wearer. Is there one... Per there wasn't even one who would raise their hands at nine. Thank you. See, the 11 a.m. crowd got some rest because you were wearing the eye mask. Thank you. I am. I'm an eye mask wearer. That's really my go-to. You know, and I, t I bring those things out because... We all tend to have something that we kind of go to. Maybe it's not one of these things. Maybe it's a certain pillow, a weighted blanket. Maybe it's something you do before you go to bed, you wind down or in some way. And I don't think there's anything wrong with any of these. But where I think we run into a problem is I really believe that if we look at what God says to us about rest, he would probably say maybe in some way, when it comes to how we think about rest, we have a tendency to miss the point. I really believe that. And I'm going to tell you something I believe to be true about Jesus. And you can disagree with me. You can go back and fact check it, all right? Dig in. That's great. But I believe that Jesus Christ, for him, uh, physical rest was actually not a big priority for him. I'll say it again. For Jesus Christ, physical rest was actually not a big priority for him. Now, I am not saying that Jesus was against sleeping or resting. Not at all. Jesus did it. I just showed you that he did it. 
And I'm not trying to make any of us feel bad for things we do, for resting. But I am telling you that I think for Jesus, it was not a big priority. For Jesus, it was not, uh, maybe not the, the level of focus that, that we put into it. I mean, if we were to take this a little deeper in our pursuit of rest, you know, we would find that um, a lot of us spend a lot of money when it comes to trying to get rest. Like, it, it invades our pocketbooks. Um, it's a huge priority. It's the thing that, uh, you know, all other things, they can go bad, but I, if I don't get my sleep, you know, I've got to make sure I got that figured out. I was uh, looking at a popular mattress website. I um, have seen commercials for this thing called a sleep number. And so I went on the website, and I wanted to know the nicest bed that they make, you know. And uh, this mattress right here is the uh, sleep number Climate 360 i10 smart bed. You can't even just buy the mattress. You have to buy the base with it. Like, it all comes together. And uh, this thing will detect through your phone if you're snoring, and it'll, like, automatically raise you up. It somehow controls the temperature of the mattress. So if you need to get warmed up and your spouse wants it cooler, you can do that. Um, it, you know, you can set a number for exactly how firm you want your mattress. And this can be yours for $9,600. But if you buy before tomorrow, they'll take $1,000 off. <laughs> Seriously. But I just think all the time, there are things in our lives where we just kind of miss the point. And I really believe that for Jesus, he might say, hey, there are some things that you're running to when it comes to rest, and they're really not working for you. Maybe not like you hoped they would. There are certain things in the Bible that are uh, certain ways that the Bible gives us truth. Um, and I would call those, there are parts of the Bible that I would call prescriptive. And there are other parts of the Bible that I would call descriptive. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. But let me just explain for a second. A prescriptive part of the Bible is a part of the Bible that gives you instructions. It gives you like, don't do this. Uh, stay away from that and make sure that you do this. That's prescriptive in the scripture. But there is a lot in God's word that is descriptive. It tries to teach us something through a story. It tries to teach us something through a theme. Do you want to know the theme of Jesus' life when it comes to rest? I'll show it to you. Let me read you a verse out of Mark chapter 1, 135. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. How about uh, Luke 6, verse 12? One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. How about Matthew 26, 40 and 41? Jesus is agonizing in the garden. He's about to go to the cross, and he goes off and prays, and then it says in verse 40 that he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He says to them, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Sometimes I think about my prayer life or my relationship with God, and I read this passage, and I think staying awake with him for one hour, if I'm tired, I can hardly stay awake with him for one minute. That's hard. And yet, I think what Jesus would say to us as a church is just in general all the time. In our lives, we run to things that don't work. Or we want, run to things that just don't do it for us quite like we wish they would. We do this with people. We do this with our jobs. We do this with things we buy. And I honestly think a lot of us have a tendency to do this with rest. In fact, I think there may be a whole side of rest that some of us are missing. And I want you to hear something that Jesus has to say to you this morning. I want you to hear it as if he is speaking directly to you. If you are a note taker, I'd love for you to get a pen. I'd love for you to get out your notes. And I would love you to write these words out in your notes, in the blanks that are there for you. And as you write them, listen to them. Let Jesus just speak them over you. This is what Jesus says. This is Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29. I'm just going to read them slowly for us this morning. These first three words, write them. 
come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in, in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Hmm. Rest for your souls. It's an interesting concept, isn't it? Rest for my soul. What would that be like? What would that even feel like? I don't know how long some of you have known me, but uh, up until a couple years ago, I was a bald guy. Did you know this about me? Some of you remember Bald Brad? I was not, uh, I was bald by choice. It was a choice I made in my life. I'll show you a picture. I was, I was really, I really was. I was a bald guy. And um, we better just take that off. That's fine. Yeah, we'll just take that one off of there. COVID came, and I got trapped in my house for two months. And I thought during that time, I thought, I'm just going to grow my hair out. And I'm going to come back from the, you know, the pandemic isolation with hair and just shock everybody. It's going to be fun. You know, shock value at times, just it makes your day. And so I did that. I didn't, you know, didn't cut it. All my life, I, you know, I was bald just because I didn't want to pay for haircuts. I just had this cheap little clipper, and I would just, you know, buzz it off every couple of weeks. That's what I did. So I just stopped doing that, let my hair grow out. And uh, I came back from the, you know, uh, isolation there, and I had hair. And one of my students came to me, and she said, Brad, did you get hair plugs? And I said, thank you so much for asking me. No, I didn't get hair plugs. I can grow hair. I really can grow hair. And so I came back from the, uh, you know, the thing, and I had hair, and I needed to get my first haircut. Now, I haven't had a haircut in like 20 years, like a long time since I was in, in high school. And so I asked around. I said, where do you, you know, people around me, where do you go to get your haircut? And they recommended a place, so I went over here and went to this lady and got in there. And she sat me down and said, you know, what would you like? And I said, I have no idea. I haven't had a haircut. And she talked me through it, started to cut my hair. Man, she just went right into my hair, just started trimming it up, snipping it down. She used these fancy styling clippers on it. It was so great. I was like, this is awesome. It's like transforming me. And then she got done cutting my hair, and she put this hot towel on my neck. And then she took it off, and she, like, shaved my neck hair. That's kind of gross. I know. But it was, I was like, this is great. And then she leaned me back into a sink. And she, have you ever done this? Like she washed my hair for me. And she put these hot towels on my face while she washed my hair. And I like was so relaxed. And then the shampoo was minty, like it smelled so good. And then she put conditioner in my hair. And then she put me back up and dried me all off and blow dried it out. And she put some fancy stuff in my hair. I don't know what it was. And then she said, do you want a back massage? I said, absolutely. <laughs> she put this thing on her hand and she massaged my back. I'm not kidding you. I walked out of that hair salon. I thought, what have I been missing my whole life? I'll pay for that all the time. That was wonderful. <laughs> and I am convinced that there are some of you, <laughs> you don't even know what it's like to have rest for your soul. You've gone your whole life and you've never known what it is. I was there. I didn't grow up going to church. I didn't have a family that told me about Jesus. And as I started to grow later in my life, my teenage years into college, and I started to find this and I could not believe it. I could not believe what I was finding in God that I could not find in anything else in this world. There was nothing else that did that for me. There was nothing else that brought me to that place. There's nothing else I had ever found in my whole life that made my spirit so strong and so at peace and so focused and so heading in the right direction. And there may be some of you that are like I was before I met Jesus. I, you have no idea. You hear me talk about this. You hear Matthew 11, rest for your soul. What is that? 
There are others of you, you kind of know, but it's way in the past. And I just want to ask with you, how do we find that? I believe your first step is simply to have consistent time every day to meet with God. We at Pathway call this God time. And I really want you to take your sermon notes handout and I want you to open it. I want you to look on the back of it. And I just, we pointed this out from time to time. Pastor Ron talks about it, but just look at it. Look at the God time notes that are provided for us every week. We only give you five days, but it is my hope that you have consistent time every day to meet with God. Do you remember that verse we read earlier? Jesus modeled this. This is Mark 1.35. Let me read it to you again. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And I believe a God time for you and for me is a combination of three things. It's solitude and prayer and scripture. To just bring these three things together consistently every day of your life I am not trying to promote for you a legalistic Christianity whereby you are an awesome Christian by all the great things that you do. That is not what I'm talking about. I am trying to tell you that maybe by God's design, ooh, I skipped this note, didn't I, earlier? Our big idea, oh, and would you go back to that? Our big idea by God's design, one of our greatest needs is rest for our souls. That really is true. By God's design, the greatest need of our soul is to rest in Jesus, is to be near to him and to meet him. We had an opportunity this summer to take some students away on a trip, and we took this one high school girl with us to a, a, a trip we do, a spiritual retreat in West Virginia. And she came. She'd never done anything like that. And she came into this retreat, not a Christian, and she accepts Christ on this trip and invites Jesus to come lead her life. And every day of these trips, we, in the morning, we get up and we have our students do God time. On a trip, a lot of times, we'll be more specific when we'll say to them, this is time alone with God. That's what we want you to practice. And we get them out and we guide them through it and we have them pray and we have them get alone and we have them read the Bible. And this young lady comes on this trip and she comes back from her God time. And she walks up to her leader. And she says these exact words. And I want you to read them. I've tried everything this world has to offer. Literally tried all of the things. But when I opened God's word for the first time, I've never tasted anything so good. And I tell you, I want this for you. I want you to have the same experience in your own life. I want you to know what it's like, not just to read words and check it off a list, but to have a moment in your every day where you meet with the living God. Why did she have this experience? Is it because she came across some incredible verse and she just happened to, to hit one of those awesome verses that every once in a while you see in the Bible? Not at all. She left saying, I've never tasted anything so sweet because she came to Jesus when she was weary and burdened, and he gave her rest. She learned from him, who is gentle and humble in heart, and she found rest for her soul in him. How do we find this? You have consistent time every day to meet with God, and your second step, I believe, is having intentional moments during your day to just focus on God, Again, this is one of those things that Jesus absolutely practiced. I read this to you earlier, Luke 5, 16. It says, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. I love this because there was no one in the history of the planet who was busier than Jesus Christ. There was no one who had a longer to-do list of things that were critically important than that man. And yet he often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. He did this intentionally in his own life. Now, Christians throughout history have had a term for what I'm talking to you about. We're not going to focus on it too much. It, you may hear it and go, I don't even know what that means. They uh, have called it one of two things. They've called it the daily office 
or some Christians have called it fixed hour prayer. And fixed hour prayer is just saying, I'm actually going to be so intentional that I'm gonna have a specific time in the middle of my day where I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna pray. The daily office, that term right there is really important. That word office comes from a Latin word that just means work. And the heart of that term is the idea that in the midst of my work, I still need to do the work of God. There is a work of my faith where I have the opportunity to bring God right into the middle of what I'm doing, of what I'm doing to make money, what I'm doing for my career. I can bring God into that. I can bring God into the midst of that. I think there are a few elements that come together for this. It's uh, just things like stop, be still, and pray. That's what a daily office is. That's what an intentional moment during your day is. I talked to a friend of mine named Jalen Miller. He's a fantastic guy if you haven't met him. And Jalen is an ER nurse here in Fort Wayne. And I asked him, I said, Jalen, I knew I was going to be talking about this. How in the world would you ever do this? Because I, I've talked to him before. I know his story. He loves what he does. He's so passionate about the way that he gets to help people as an ER nurse. And I remember, you know, weeks ago, months ago, he told me that he doesn't even take a break as an ER nurse. It's not that they don't give him a break. He just chooses not to take it because he wants to be there for people. He wants to be engaged his whole 12-hour shift. He's on it. And that amazes me. And so I went to him and I said, so how in the world would an ER nurse do this? And his first response was, you know, I don't do that perfectly, but there are moments, and he said it, I didn't show him my notes, he just said there are moments where I am about to go into a room and I just stop. And in that, he's, he's being still. And he said, I'll just pray before I go in. And then he told me that, and I don't know what this means, that there's a trauma room, and sometimes he has to be in the trauma room. And he said, you know, there are times that we don't know what's coming through that door. But as we're waiting, I just stop. And I pray. And I thought, even in a career like that, where he can't do fixed hour prayer. He can't have a determined time to pray, but he still does it. He still is saying, I want God to be a part of this. I know I need to go to him in the midst of my work to find rest for my soul. How do we find this? You know, I believe we can uh, have consistent time every day. We can have intentional times during the day, and the last one I'll give you is I believe God would call us to maybe the most difficult one, to have an entire day each week to rest in God. And we call this the Sabbath. That word Sabbath is just a Hebrew word. It means to cease or to uh, stop. Or to rest, excuse me, to cease or to rest. It's uh, actually one of the Ten Commandments. It's the fourth of the Ten Commandments where God says, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy to the Lord. And it's in reference to the account of God creating everything. In Genesis chapter 1, it says that God created the heavens and the earth and the land and the water, that he created animals and birds, and he created people. But on the seventh day, God rested. I'm going to ask you a super obvious question, all right? Did God rest on the seventh day because he was tired? No, he did not. He wasn't tired at all. He was not exhausted. Why did he rest? He took time just to delight in all he had made. And that's really what the Sabbath is. The Sabbath is just an intentional moment, not to deprive ourselves, but to delight in God. And God actually tells you and me, this is like foreign language for a lot of us. Take a whole day and just delight in me. Like think of it like a snow day. Like the roads are shut down, the businesses are shut down. You get a snow day every week. That's 52 snow days a year. That's seven weeks of snow days. Just stop and just delight in me. A Sabbath can include things like just an activity you enjoy. Do that. Uh, unplanned time to relax. Enjoying the beauty of God's world in some way. Nurturing relationships. Worshiping at your church, with your church. Doing a God time. Those are great things to do on a Sabbath. Maybe even just something else that you just delight in. And just do it to the Lord. Maybe it's making a special meal that you have on that day, and you know what, we're going to enjoy this, or we're going to have a special dessert today, because we're just going to delight in God together as a family. God invites you and me to do that, and this is so important. Jesus says in Mark 2, 27, he says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man, for the Sabbath. And all throughout Jesus' story, he's trying to tell people that in his culture, the Sabbath was such a legalistic thing. People had to do it in specific times, on a specific day. For the Jews, it was always Saturday. 
that was their Sabbath. And they had all these rules about things they couldn't do. And Jesus was saying, this was, you were not made for it. It was made for you. God gives this to you and me as a gift. Why? So that we can find rest for our souls. I'll give you a final thought from uh, the author of this book, Peter Scazzaro, Pastor Peter Scazzaro. He says, at the heart of original sin is the refusal to accept God's rhythm for us. The essence of being in God's image is our ability, like God, to stop. If we can stop for one day a week or for many Sabbaths each day, the daily office, we touch something deep within us as image bearers of God. And I believe God, your Father, is inviting you to maybe something you've never had, to have rest for your soul. Maybe even he's calling to you and saying, you actually need to get out of your sleep number, Climate 360, a little earlier. And maybe just a little less physical rest. Not because he's against it, but because he knows your greatest need is rest for your soul. There is probably someone here who has never had this because you've never come to Jesus. You've never asked him to come into your life. And the message you need to hear today is that Jesus came into this world, God from heaven, as a man here on earth, to go to the cross, to pay the debt that was owed because of sin, so that if you believe in him, he can come into your life. And when he comes into your life, he changes everything. And he says to you, come to me. Learn from me. I'll give you rest. There's someone else here this morning who you need to hear this. You need to know that your life has a prescriptive element and a descriptive element. That your life, in your life, you have parts of your life where you know the right answers. You do. You're a follower of Jesus. You love him. You've read the Bible quite a few times probably. There's also a descriptive, a story that you're telling, a theme that is there. And if you're honest, when it comes to your relationship with God, the theme is like that operator on the Titanic. Shut up, I'm busy. I know it's hard to hear that. I'm going to say something even harder. Every day, every day, that you and I, and I've had my days, that we choose not to meet with God. That's what we're saying to him. That's all we're saying. I'm busy, it's hard. And instead of shut up, I'm busy, let's leave this moment and say, God, would you speak up? I'm listening, I'm listening. God, I see today that I've been wrong in how I've done my schedule and how I've conducted my life God, that I've been running to the wrong things and they are not working for me. And I'm committed today, Father in heaven, to come to you because I'm weary and burdened. I believe you'll give me rest. God, I want to take your yoke upon me and I want to learn from you because you are gentle and humble in heart and in you I will find rest for my soul. Father in heaven, we thank you for this truth. God, we thank you that you love us enough to call us away from the busyness, to call us away from even some of those things that we're running to and hoping in and, and to call us to you. God, at the heart of this morning, I believe that's what it is. It's a call to you. It's a call to love you. It's a call to come to you. And so, Lord, would you strengthen us? Would you encourage us? And to the one who's here that needs to accept you into their life for the first time, would you provide for them right now the nudge they need to pray to you, to just say, Lord, would you forgive me? Jesus, I believe in you. Come into my life. Father, for many of us, many days it's me. God, we need you to help us reverse the story, reverse the theme. And instead of I'm busy, God, we want to move to I'm listening. We want to have a consistent time to meet with you. We want to bring you in to each day, a part of our work. And God, even help us to start to set aside an entire day to rest in you. And would you bless? Would you move? Would you help us to be strong 
beneath the surface. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless all of you. I'm so thankful that you're here. If, uh, thank you. If you're new or if you just received Jesus, talk to our uh, guest services team. They would love to meet you. If you need help taking a next step in your faith, that's what our Next Steps team is for. And if you want prayer, we'll be right down front. We'd love to meet with you and pray with you. God bless you. Have an awesome day.